Okay, so let's go to admin and finance. And admin and finance is just really, it's the understanding that every, every city department or division that's responsible for care and shelter is really responsible for managing their documentation process. Now there's going to be a central point in the city's finance and admin function that's going to eventually collect that, organize and compile it and retain it. But each department should be initially, should have a process in place to do the basic record retention for finance and admin documentation. And that's things like tra you know, tracking personnel time and personnel costs. I will tell you that in the city of LA, we use the incident command system 214, the ICS 214, as a good timesheet. Now, we're all doing regular timesheets for the city. That doesn't you know, eliminate our regular timesheets, but when we go in and work in the EOC, uh, we use the ICS 214. In the field, they're already using the ICS 214 in field command to document duties and responsibilities. And that, doc that 214 is a very effective document because what it does is it says, at what time were you doing what? And so if somebody comes back, and it is a recognized document, by the way, by FEMA as a record of you being assigned specifically to an emergency. If you use timesheets, the problem is, is that it doesn't definitely define, unless you're doing some kind of a code tracking, like you already have emergency codes that are embedded in your cost tracking, your timekeeping program, a lot of people don't. If you can pull out those hours under a certain code, you can use your regular timekeeping process. If you don't have that, the ICS 214 is a really effective form. And the way it's done is if I walk in the EOC at 0600, at 0600 reported for shift work, 0600 received an incoming briefing, 0615 started coordination activities, managing the, you know, activating the shelter and ensuring resources were provided. At 0730 attended the planning coordination meeting. You want to define out those duties because it isn't just, okay, I showed up at 0600, I had lunch at 1200, and I got off work at 1700. You have to actually identify those duties. But if you use the ICS 214 and you log it like that, then you can use that as a time record. Yes, Ashu. as a way of making sure people don't kind of self-deploy <laughs> out and, and do things. So you can kind of rein in. Everybody's here is probably going to have limited staff. So when um, when there are issues, people so want to really be helpful and go out either to the shelter or go out wherever the, the activities are. If you have the 214 and say, hey, you know what, come check in here, get your 214, go to wherever, so you can kind of control that. And then at the same time, when you're done, come back to a location. It could be a, it could be a, a desk in the shelter, you know, at the shelter or at, at the EOC, turn in your paperwork. So that's, you're officially, you know, checking people in, checking people out. So it's a way to m manage your resources. So, so, you know, a week or two later, somebody doesn't say, well, I worked 30 hours, you know, over that weekend. And you're like, I didn't see you at all. I have no idea. So that's, it's, it's kind of a good way to reinforce that. Like and if that. you can set that policy, it's, yeah. it, it acts as a double, uh, double effect right. of what you're trying to do. And then that whole centralization and compiling of the documents is already embedded in that process because now you have it all in one place and that person can organize it. So that's really a great one. So if you have internal departments, they're all going to be responsible. It was resource management. If you have departments, and I say departments, divisions, because I don't know what you have. If you have internal resource ordering between departments, um, those departments are responsible for collecting all those documents, keeping track of them, filling them out correctly, and eventually getting them to a central location. In this section, um, do I talk about it here? Um, hold on, give me one second. Yes, okay, so in this section, what you're going to want to define at the very, or identify at the very bottom of the section is what city department or what city position is the final point of, of, of where those documents have to eventually come to rest, where that packet gets organized and retained for record keeping purposes. Because um, I can tell you that there have been a number of incidents over the last few years where jurisdictions have requested reimbursement for incident response costs 
and FEMA has come in and they've received the money and then FEMA came in three to five years later, audited their documentation, a lot of stuff was missing and wasn't there and they had to pay eight million dollars back. And it was a very small county with not probably a lot of monetary resources. And so even though a lot of us kind of put finance and admin back in the corner, we don't think about it, finance and admin is so critical in the long run that you really need to embed them right away. So you have to have that process very clear to people. You got to start on the front end, good documentation filling out, good documentation accuracy, good organization with the documentation, good, you know, it, compiling it, and then finally moving it to the correct place in the city so you can hold on to that documentation so you do not risk losing money. Another agency, another uh, organization that lost a lot of money, I worked at LAX during 9-11. And we were actually closed down for three days, but we were doing a massive command post function at LAWA. We were feeding people, people were coming on board, we were paying for a lot of outside agencies, and the documentation retention was not done effectively, and we weren't able to, be, we weren't able to recover any of that money at all. The airport lost it all. So that's why you're paying higher passenger fees. <laughs> Just a side note. And higher terminal fees and higher costs for the coffee that you drink there. But anyway, so it really is important. I can't stress enough. Admin and finance, you really got that. You have to get that embedded. Okay. So this is the chance where we get to hear from Dave. This section is he's coming up here is in this section you're going to list all your memorandums of understanding but what you also want to do is you want to scan those and you actually want to include them in the annex and the reason for that is those memorandums of understandings are almost like a an agreement contract and there may be people that are picking up this annex and aren't aware of these so having them all in one place so they're actually identifiable from all your everybody that's going to be reading this is a really good idea so list them and then scan copies into this section. Well, thank you. Okay. When you want to talk about memorandums of understanding, you need to have a couple of things in mind. First of all, the service you're looking for, when you're going to need it, how long you're going to need it for. Those type of operations are going to be critical to supporting your response. So let's talk about time first of all. Normally we all work an eight hour day except fire. But uh, when you're in emergency response mode, you're a 24-hour day operation. That means you're consuming products and services at three times your normal rate. So you have to have a plan for how you're going to uh, restock yourself, to resupply, as you will. So you got to remember that when you're writing your MOU. Uh, a couple other things you just want to make sure you, you uh, take into account is an MOU should define how you are and are not going to do business. We agree to do X, but we can't do Y. Clearly stated, plain English. I'm married to a lawyer, and I share that with you so you know I haven't won an argument in 32 years. <laughs> <laughs> but I have hope. I have hope, and that's important. But one of the great things she has taught me is to think rationally about it. Lay it all out in front of you, and think it step by step to make sure you capture all the important points. Defining how you don't do business means you have to get someone else to do those things for you. So it's important you know where that line is. So remember that when you're doing your MOUs. Keep it simple, okay? It doesn't have to be a multiplayer trade type of, of you know, complex coordinated effort. Keep it simple so you, everyone can understand, it, especially the people who are not there when you uh, create the document. If you, again, retire or move on to whatever it is, that legacy document's gonna be behind. Make it simple so people understand what it is and what it's doing, okay? I want to give you some examples of MOUs. In my previous life in Long Beach, we had to negotiate not only with the American Red Cross, our MOU of how we're going to work, because Long Beach has a, a park and rec department, several facilities. We use those in sheltering, but we also have a school system. And because the way the city's laid out, some areas were park rich, some areas were school rich. And we needed to partner with each other to make sure we could account for all the students and account for all the residents. So when we did that MOU with the Red Cross, we also made sure the American Red Cross worked with Long Beach Unified School District. And our MOU said the same thing. We defined our services, defined what we couldn't do, and made sure we had consistency. And then we also made sure that uh, the city 
had a similar agreement with the Long Beach Unified School District, so we closed the loop. There were no gaps in our arrangement, in our uh, way of doing business. It's really important you do that. You have to look at things operationally as well. Schools have a responsibility to take care of their student base. So if they're in session or not in session, changes the arrangement. So make sure you look at that, discuss it, and come up with a plan that can work for you. Uh, you also make sure you look at uh, some school districts cover more than one area, cover more than one city, okay? So make sure that you look at the whole aspect of what they're serving, because if they're serving the city next to you, but that school's located in your area, you know, you've got some problems with, with that arrangement. So you have to make sure you can account for those bodies. Define the protocol for how you're gonna activate. How are you gonna spin up? Have at least three contacts that you can get to to make sure you can get this agreement in motion. A single point of failure is gonna kill you every time. It's not just one office, get three offices. So you can always go down the, the road of your list to find someone who can help you, okay? Um, do, do, do. Also define things, uh, for example, the support systems you're gonna need for each other. With the American Red Cross and the city of Long Beach, we had our MEU that said they're gonna operate our shelters if available, you know, if they have the resource to do so. But the city of Long Beach provides support services to them. We provide custodial, we provide a maintenance staff if something should break, then we'll replace it. We'll provide some technical support for computers, software, get the internet up and working in the site as soon as possible. So look at the details of how you need to use the space and build that into your MOU, okay? Um, an important part is make sure you define how costs are gonna be covered. Unfortunately, goodwill is, is free, but paper towel costs money. So how are we gonna recover these costs? Make sure you define that in your MOU and come to a clear understanding of who is covering what. It makes sure, it, it's a way to make sure we can recover the costs if we get some federal assistance or state assistance later, okay? Now, a couple other things we talk about and we use agreements or, or contracts uh, overall that way. Um, you have to do a little bit of blue sky planning, blue sky leadership sometimes it's called. When things are sunny and bright, make your plan. So right now, think about where are you gonna get food if we have a catastrophic event? What's around you? Subway's open 24 hours usually. Those refrigerators are not gonna be on. I gotta deal with Subway. Make me as many sandwiches as you have inventory for. I'll take them right now. Now you got a plan. They can't use it anyway, it's gonna to go to waste. But you're gonna need the food, because you're gonna to have to feed somebody, either your eternal staff or the people in your shelter. So think about how you can use those resources. Um, one of the things that we did in Long Beach is we had a deal with the Long Beach Unified School District for feeding. They had to keep 10 days of food on hand to feed all the faculty and all the students. So we negotiated a deal with them, they would give us three days worth of food. So from when bang went off to three days later, they supplied all the food for all our PD, our fire guys, our EOC staff, get to us up and running. We defined the terms by once we actually proclaimed or, or declared we were open, within six hours we got our first shipment. Apples, oranges, coffee, sodas, stuff, okay? Within eight hours, we got our first set of sandwiches, meals, etc. We even came up with distribution points that these deliveries were made to so we can get them out to the field efficiently. We also upped the calorie count because an active policeman or fireman is gonna need more than a 12-year-old, right? We also made sure that they were foods that were easily handled, especially the first 24-hour shipments, sandwiches, prepackaged fruit, those type of things. You could take it, stick it in your pocket, and eat it later when you had time. So think of those kind of things. How will the service be used? How will the product be needed and used? And put that into your MOU. That makes sense, any questions? What else do we want to talk about? Um, talk about contracts. Um, something to think about is look at your resources within your area. We know from zero to three days, you're pretty much going to be on your own. Help will come in three to five days. So look through your city, what's available? I had a deal when I was in Long Beach, I bought half of Costco. Once it went bad, I bought half of Costco. Why did I only buy half? Any thoughts? You have to leave some for the residents, right? For the local community. But we bought half of Costco to make sure we had water and food and those other things to make sure our operation would work. Okay. So think about those kind of agreements. Have a deal with Home Depot, Lowe's, 
whatever your local hardware store is. So when something bad happens, you can get there, they'll open the doors, you take whatever you need. Plywood, blocks, whatever that may be, it's available to you right there. If you do a little blue sky planning, your response is gonna be greatly enhanced. And that can be done by you talking with your peers and figuring out what your needs are and how you're gonna solve those needs. A big one I think you should work on right away is fuel. Where are you gonna get fuel from? If you have uh, gas stations, make agreements with them that they'll allow you to come in with your own electric pump, pump the fuel out. It's just something to think about. Any questions about contracts? How they can be used to enhance your response? Okay, a couple other just general points I wanna to make to you. I've recognized several smiling faces in the room as being in our ICS classes from the last uh, fall and winter. Remember we talked about ICS as a standard way of approach, a standard organization, a standard protocol for doing things. There's a consistency to it. Think of the Red Cross model for sheltering like you would ICS. It is a good model, it's worked, it's established, and if we follow it and we use it like we ICS, the things that come after will be much easier for us. We talked about reimbursements, right? If we follow that protocol and that system, we've proven to them we had it work in a consistent manner with what they accept, which is the Red Cross method. Now, it is true that the Red Cross is a wonderful organization, they do great work, but there are times when they've not been available. Remember a couple of years ago, we had hurricanes in Florida, Puerto Rico, Texas. In Houston alone, you had to operate 160 shelters. You operated 50 of them. The other ones were operated by who's there that sometimes will be you. It's rare, it's very rare, but you have to plan for that occurrence. So dig down deep in this book, bring it back to your organization, have a good conversation about how to make it work for your team, and make sure you can exercise it, because it can't happen to you someday. Um, make sure you have some kind of plan for how to deal with the day-to-day -day human interaction. Study the psychology of events or, or disasters. Um, why are disasters so, so disabilitating to people. Does anybody have an idea why the psychology of an emergency? So they happen out of the wall. They just happen. Sorry? Well, the, the big thing is it takes away your personal power over your own world. When, you, when a disaster happens, an earthquake, a disastrous fire, or whatever, you no longer make any decisions. You don't decide when you eat. You don't decide what you wear. You don't decide even where you go. Someone else is making all those decisions for you. Some people can handle that. Some people can. And when you get them in the shelter, <laughs> sometimes they snap. So make sure you have a plan for how to deal with the mental health side of things. Work with the faith-based community. Have people there when they're coming in that they could talk to. A 20-minute conversation with a priest, or rabbi, shaman, whatever, may be just the things that helps them get perspective back. <coughs> and as soon as they get perspective back, they're more used to their families. So think about the mental health side of things. Think about an issue just in family matters. Sometimes husbands and wives disagree. Don't let it become a domestic issue. Have some tools there to help you deal with those type of things. Did I miss anything? No, we actually added. Okay, cool, That's now I'm gone. Great. <laughs> Good. Any questions? Thank you for your time. Actually, I would recommend the schools because I really miss those Friday fish sticks. I don't know about you guys, but I love those. So I would recommend schools. <laughs> I think the best thing to think about the way that it really makes sense to us at a gut level about memorandums of understanding is if you if this were your own home, okay, and you were renovating your kitchen, you would not go to a contractor and go, you know what, just come Friday, whatever you do, that's fine with me. And you just go ahead and decide what you're going to do when you come. And I know that's a really simple explanation, but if you think about it in that terms, it really kind of is like an aha. It's like you would no more do that with a contractor because don't you want to know exactly what are you doing and what's it supposed to look like and what am I getting and what am I not getting? Because I will tell you, I've had a couple surprises with assuming that a contractor is going to do a part of a job and I thought, well, that's a logical part of the job. And I found out after the fact that I didn't do the due diligence to ask, is this included? Because to me, if you're going to put in a floor, 
putting the facing around the floor to make it look nice as a woman. It seems to me a very logical thing, but it wasn't to that contractor. So if you think about it in that terms, you understand why we do memorandums of understanding, because it makes sure that everybody knows what to expect, what they're gonna get, as Dave says, and what you're not gonna get. And once you know what you're not gonna get, then you can take steps to shore that gap up. So thanks for listening on that, but that, and it's not easy. The best place to start, number one, let's start with American Red Cross. That's totally doable. You can walk out of this workshop, schedule a meeting with them and get that done. There's already a template. They've done it a million times. It's not gonna be uh, very extensive, but then start looking and developing that list of people that you actually wanna sit down with. But American Red Cross is a great place to start because you're gonna learn how to negotiate an MOU with them because they've been doing it for so long. Okay, so let's go ahead and move. Uh, we're probably going to move through the remainder of this template fairly quickly. Uh, this is authorities and references. And the good news is, is for the federal and the state, we have given you all the references, or not the authorities and references. We, for the authorities, we've given you all of the federal and state authorities. Some of those were identified uh, when we talked about what you're, why you're mandated to do care and shelter in your jurisdiction that's actually referenced in that executive summary, and then it was repeated in the purpose. Well, here's actually the references. Um, a lot of these, uh, not references, I gotta stop using that word. A lot of the authorities that that came from are listed in the section under state and federal. Where you're gonna need to add is what authorities do you have in place for your city? So do you have any city emergency ordinances that are directly related to the support of your shelter. And I will tell you that for us in the city of LA, the number one authority that we have that supports shelter is the Disaster Service Worker Program. So on our uh, city authority, we quote the state requirement to have the Disaster Service Worker Program and what that means for city employees. <laughs> but you might have other policies. You're obviously going to put your city emergency plan title there. Um, if you don't have it posted online, then delete that, that verbiage that says provide the link, but you are actually going to cite that emergency plan. So you'll see the city section you have to fill out. A lot of that you have to include yourself. The references, and just to kind of review real quick, the, we had the county reference, or uh, county authorities, the state authorities, and then the federal some of the key ones at the federal um, that really, uh, American with Disabilities Act, we identify NIMS, we identify the National Response Framework, uh, we go into the emergency support functions. If for any of you who really wanna re get a real good, intense uh, understanding and awareness of the ESFs, is if you go to the FEMA online courses, just Google that, FEMA online courses, um, and there's just, there's a boatload of FEMA online courses that you can take on numerous subjects. But 801 through 815 cover the ESFs. Um, they're a little bit intensive, but I will tell you, it is great to read them because you will, you'll learn about a lot of departments that you didn't even know existed and their responsibilities. And it's really where we're gonna really need to understand ESFs is when we have a catastrophic level incident. That's 7.8 earthquake because they're the ones that are gonna be showing up at our door and we're gonna to have to figure out whether it's a joint field office or maybe even at our local EOCs or the county EOC, most likely at a joint field office or the county EOC or the state. We have to understand what they can bring to the table and what they don't bring to the table. It's just as important as our memorandums of understanding is knowing what they provide. So that's a good place to learn it. And you can do that at your leisure. By the way, any online courses with FEMA, you can actually go in and start the course. As long as you finish a module, you can sign out of it and go back to the later on. So that's just an FYI on that. Okay, so let's go the Rehabilitation Act, service animals, there's legislation on that. And I don't I don't want to click on that because I don't want them to win the pool in the back table back there of me <laughs> leaving the plan. So state Oh, good, okay, see, Michael, I knew would have my back. <laughs> so city, and then like I said, the references are pretty straightforward. 
The only one that you're going to have to put in there, remember at the very beginning we talked about the demographics and the census data, is you're going to put in whatever source that you identify in the very beginning of the plan for your census data, you're going to put it back here in the references. And there's not very many references for this, um, for this thing. So you know what? I don't care if I lose, so I'm going to click. Woohoo! See, I wasn't attached to winning or losing, so I could do that and take the risk. Okay, so let's go into, on page um, 52, we're going to move into Annex Development, Maintenance, and Training. And this is where you're going to get a little bit of a chance to kind of repeat that American Red Cross training information, because we talk about what training uh, is really recommended. For all of you who are fairly new to emergency management or even planning, there's a term called POETI. Okay, and it's a process. The first thing that we do is we draft plans, okay, and then we operationalize or organize around our plans, okay. Then we equip to our plans. In other words, we go out and we identify and get those resources that we need to carry out our plans. Then we train to the plan, and then we exercise the plan. So when we talk about a plan, it's not just, it is part of this whole preparedness cycle that we're talking about how we do this. But um, this plan, like every other plan, should be going through that cycle. So we talk a little bit about beyond the drafting of this plan. First of all, how are we going to maintain it? Well, we know we're going to go through that review, that periodic review that we already identified at the very beginning when we talked about plan certification review process, etc. But back here in this section, we're going to go into it a little bit more de in depth so the reader really sees that this is our formal maintenance process. At the very beginning, there's some generic language that talks about how you develop this plan. You're not going to write in here, I single-handedly attended a workshop, drafted the plan, and then our organ organization approved it. Because really, is a plan good or effective when it's created in a vacuum? No. Because what you will find is everybody was probably really appreciative that you wrote the plan because they didn't want to write it. But when it comes to you activating and implementing the plan, their participation at the time of implementation may not happen because guess what? They weren't part of the plan. They might agree with it, they might disagree with it. So we're going to talk about how do you engage people, how do you get that consensus, how do you involve your stakeholders so they are really part of this planning process. Number one, to make sure you have the right information in the plan. Number two, to identify any information that you missed. But probably more important than anything else, you engage people and get their consensus that they support the plan. And that's going to be really critical for the implementation. So when we talk about this development, there's language in there that says we involved all stakeholders in that development process. So it just kind of states that we followed. And it's actually, if you go into comprehensive uh, CPG 101, it talks about how do we develop plans and one of the first steps. And I'm going to go into that in that post-workshop guidance. It also talks about when would we might, when might we, when might we need to take this plan and pull it back and make some changes. And if you notice those three bullets in the middle of the page, it actually identifies the circumstances that you're probably going to go ahead and you're going to say, you know what, let's pull this plan back and let's go ahead and update it. So obviously the first thing is somebody reviewed the plan, they were reading it, something's changed, a program or a process or an assigned responsibility, and a department calls you up and says, guess what, we have a change in the plan, that there's something is inaccurate in the plan. If it's a small thing, like it's just a bullet that needs to be redacted, you can just make the change, go into the record of changes, just note the change and that's fine. But if it's something that affects the overall section or a, pr a process that you have, it's a good, then you're going to need to take that plan and you're going to need to go through a revision with your stakeholders um, of some kind. A conflict, a conflict in how their response or support activities are performed. Uh, somebody reads through the plan and something's changed or the information was inaccurate. And it really does kind of degrade the effectiveness and uh, the effectiveness of that plan. The plan is no longer applicable. Uh, conflict between list, their listed activities and responsibilities with the annex. 
Hopefully you can eliminate this by involving the stakeholders in these periodic review meetings, but you could have a discrepancy. Uh, sometimes it happens when an agency speaks for another agency, like for example, police department says, you know what, GSD is gonna provide us all the fuel we need. They provide us fuel all the time, and GSD doesn't show up in the meeting. So somebody puts down the bullet that GSD provides fuel, and then four months down the road, and unfortunately it's because GSD didn't participate in your planning process, but they say, no, we don't do that. Now that's a major gap in the plan if you're identifying somebody with a responsibility and it's not their responsibility. So those are the times when you're gonna to need to take a look at your plan. You're either gonna do some changes. Uh, the way you can approach changes in the plan is if it's just a section, a lot of times what you can do is redo the section uh, email that section out to everybody, because a lot of us send out electronic copies of plans to our stakeholders. Just send the section out and say, this has been changed, please insert it in your plan, and, that, and make a record of changes, and that can suffice. But if it's a major change to you know, a procedure or process, you're gonna have to move that plan back through a review, an update, pro an, an update process. Now, that could happen inside of your two-year or three-year review. You're gonna do a formal review every two to three years, whatever you decide. That's recommended by, the, by federal and state guidelines on emergency plans, is you update every two to three years. Um, but you may be updating in between. Uh, but your formal review process where you're gonna send it to council or you're gonna send it through your city manager is gonna be every two to three years. So really, I guess what I'm saying is I can't dictate to you how that's going to look on your plan. You're going to have to decide how that's going to work in your jurisdiction. You are going to have that formal update process to, once every two to three years. But if the change is so significant that it really affects the plan, you're definitely going to want to go through a review and then back through that formal approval process again because technically your plan is not viable if it's a major section in the plan and only you will know that because you know your jurisdiction's program. Does that make sense? So if you notice um, every other year or insert, you know, whatever time frame you want, you are just gonna, ha you're gonna have to identify that and you're gonna have to identify who's the one that's responsible for leading the review. So this is usually your emergency management department, but if fire is, has the emergency management role, then you're gonna be the one that's gonna be responsible for getting everybody, contacting everybody, and getting them ready. I will tell you what I did, because I ran the planning division for the city of LA, and like I said, we have about 40 plans. So what I did is I actually, because I kept on seeing the same people from the departments showing up to all the different meetings when I took over. And I thought, you know, this isn't really a very effective process because it's kind of, uh, kind of disrespectful of everybody's time if we're making them come to, like, if you're doing, you know, 10 to 20 plans over the next two years, and you're making these people come to 20 meetings and it's the same people, there's a more effective approach. So what I took is I took, I kind of, I, I got with all my departments and identified those people, those core planners, and I made them planners. I gave them a planning title, which I will tell you kind of makes them feel a little special and they enjoy more working with you. So you start from that team approach. They're your core planners. They're expert planners, and they like to hear that. And what I did is I put them on a group email. And so what I would do is I, ahead of time, sat down on a project management sheet, and I project managed out all my plans. So for the next six months, I would do two to three plans. If they were from scratch or from I was updating, I put two to three, two to three plans together. Now what I tried to do with the plans is I tried to tie them together. So if I was doing an evacuation plan, I would do the mass care and shelter plan at the same time, and I might do public information and warning at the same time because they, they kind of, a lot of the, those three plans kind of overlay each other. And what I would end up doing is I would send them out early notices. I would continue to send them out the project management sheet, but I would say, okay, in six months, we're gonna have a formal update of this plan a good idea to make this as easy as possible is start reviewing that plan now. When you project manage it out for your people, it becomes a lot more achievable. Another advantage that you have right now is with this template, if you're gonna move forward and develop other annexes, 
a lot of this language in this template can actually be used in the other annexes because it's been made so general. And that's actually what we did uh, in a lot, of, a lot of our annexes. A lot of the sections read the same. We kept it very general. Where they differ is concept of operations and roles and responsibilities, and then some other minor changes in the language. So that's just something to think about there for your maintenance is look at how you can strategically plan out your plan maintenance. When we talk about training, okay, so let's go into the training. You're gonna want to definitely set up a training schedule uh, for your plan, okay? And then you're definitely gonna want to, how many people have an exercise program for their jurisdiction? So if you've never done a, it's called a three-year training and exercise workshop, uh, what you do ahead of time is you get all your departments together and you look at you know, your gaps in your response and recovery operations and you say, okay, what kind of training do we need? And so if you have gaps, let's say you have gaps in your, uh, you've had, yeah, in all your after action reports, your care and shelter operations don't meet your expectations. So obviously we're gonna pull out that care and shelter annex and we're gonna pull it out, we're gonna review it. Um, but obviously if your annex isn't working, um, in your operation, there's a, there's a training gap too, right? So that annex need is going to drive a training requirement. And then that training requirement is going to kind of roll into what exercises do I need to do? So you can actually take a look at what plans you're having to develop and actually time project management out your training schedule and your exercise schedule. And all plans, um, we should be taking those through a formal exercise process. How many people are familiar with the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program? Where we do good, where we approach uh, our exercises from a building block perspective, okay? So what we definitely want to do is we want to make sure that we're using the, that, those levels of exercises where maybe when you, this is the way, this is the way you build exercises around a plan. The first thing you want to do is a seminar because you're going to bring everybody in. You're going to say, okay, I sent you out the plan two weeks ago. I just want to go over it. Great thing is, is this PowerPoint that I'm going through that I'm a little bit behind on. That was good. Okay. So this PowerPoint, you could actually use this PowerPoint as a briefing, as the PowerPoint for your seminars. Because I built this PowerPoint around this plan, right? So if you wanted to use the PowerPoint to do a seminar for all the people that you'd like to give a briefing once you complete the plan, um, you can go ahead and use this PowerPoint, um, just do some minor changes. Uh, but then after you do a seminar, then what you're gonna do, we've already done a workshop. You're doing a workshop right now, so you don't need to worry about that. I know where I talk about training and exercise, it's in the post-workshop guidance. So you're gonna get a chance, I'm going, wait a second, where did it go? It's in the post-workshop guidance. So, uh, so I'm not gonna go into it in depth, but you know what, I'm gonna hold off. I'm gonna talk about exercises when I get to that document. So, so I don't slow anything down here. So, hold that thought on exercises and we'll jump ahead. But basically, what you're stating in this section is this is how we develop the plan, this is how we're gonna maintain it, and we are going to build training around it. And exercises are considered a type of training. But one of the things that's really important is when you have a real life incident in your jurisdiction, or when you do an exercise, you wanna take that after action report and you wanna take a good look at it and see what areas did we do well in? What are our strengths in our plan? Okay, so if I were gonna activate a shelter site, or care and shelter site, and I would do my after action report, I'd pull that, I'd take that information, the next time I go to review my plan and update it, I'm gonna pull that AAR out, and I'm gonna say, okay, what did we do? What's our strengths? What do we wanna continue? And then what are our areas of opportunity for improvement? Uh, because those AARs are really good, useful documents to take a look at your plan and say what didn't work. Was it, an, was it a procedure? Was it a resource? Did we not have an appropriate position? Did we not assign the right responsibility? So those after action reports are really part of that improvement process, but they actually help you as you update those plans. So be sure and uh, pull out any AARs that you might have. So. Going through the attachments, the first one is pretty straightforward. 
I think I captured all the acronyms in the document. I was up till like three o'clock one morning with the copy of the plan and then the acronym list and cross checking. But I might have missed one, so you might want to review again those acronyms, make sure everything's captured, but I'm pretty confident they're all there. If you add any language and you have acronyms that are specific to your jurisdiction, like for example, you have department acronyms, you need to add these to that list because they won't be on here. These are the ones that are currently in that document. Okay. Uh, one, of the, one of the components of this project was to go out and really research um, best practices out there. You know, obviously American Red Cross um, has the best practices on shelter management anywhere. So you notice we've referenced them a lot. We have our subject matter experts sitting here and they've been giving input. But one of the things that was asked for as part of this project is to give you some kind of checklist guidance. And so what I did is I actually went out there and I researched a lot of models. I definitely incorporated the American Red Cross. Um, but I actually looked and what I've developed is a number of checklists for you that you can go ahead and use for some specific situations and areas. So the first one that we talked about, you may have a situation where people have been evacuated or they spontaneously left their area and they just show up at a site, uh, a facility. A lot of times that happens when they have gone and they've used, the, like the, say there's a wildfire and the previous wildfire, they went to a location for a shelter. And so they automatically may show up at that location again because they're familiar with it. And so you may have a group a gathering already at a site. So when you show up, if you're the shelter manager, you're the one responsible for the facility, you've got a bunch of people out there right away. And let's say you have inclement weather and you have to move them in as quickly as you can we have developed a quick startup checklist. And this is for those situations where you show up, there's already people congregated, and you just, you know, you wanna move them in out of the weather, and then you wanna get up at least some very rudimentary, maybe get some food and water out on some tables. You wanna start registering. So this is a very, very short checklist for those situations where you're gonna have to step in and you're gonna have to quickly open it, okay? So that checklist um, is definitely useful in those types of situations, but what you really want to do is you're going to have two situations. You have that spontaneous uh, uh, showing up at a site. You're going to do that quick startup checklist, and then you need to move into this attachment C, which is the much more lengthy shelter manager checklist. And so even though you may have done a quick startup, you're gonna wanna stop at some point, go back, pull out this checklist, and go back and start over on the items. Because this is a much more comprehensive checklist and obviously it's the shelter manager checklist. So it's gonna have a lot of responsibilities in regards of staffing, communications, um, what you should be looking for as far as the facility, and a lot, of these, um, a lot of these responsibilities are supported by the American Red Cross forms, and we're gonna go through those briefly, okay? So if you notice, if we start out on the shelter manager checklist, um, you're gonna go ahead and fill in the nature of the incident, some basic information, because this checklist does become a record, and you're gonna identify your, you know, some key staff, Okay, and then it's gonna go into some standard operating procedures, because a checklist is kind of like, a, it is an SOP. It actually goes into tasks and activities, and so it, uh, a checklist kind of rests at that SOP field operation guide level. So we've got preparing the shelter. Obviously, um, one of the things in looking at some of these inserts so we identify, use the facility shelter opening and closing inspection form. This is a great form for that initial inspection. Um, it actually records a lot of information and it actually includes accessibility questions on it. So that's a really great form to use. Okay. Um, but if you're during that facility inspection, you, uh, you deem that that site is unsafe it's critical that you immediately notify either the one of the points of wherever the initial point of 
oversight of the, of the shelter is. So if it's the field command, then you got to notify field command right away. If it's the EOC, you got to notify the EOC right away. It may be your supervisor. Let's say the EOC isn't activated and there's no field command and that's some, every once in a while, this could happen. We write plans to kind of cover all situations. You may be calling your supervisor and letting them know that it's not, if you're the shelter manager, that it's not safe. Um, or it may be a city position. For example, in our city, if a shelter was not, was deemed unsafe, uh, we might be calling the EMD 24 seven duty officer. So that's a city position. If that doesn't apply, if it's either supervisor, field or EOC, then you delete that city position. But if a shelter site is unsafe, you need to let somebody formally know that as soon as possible because you're going to have to identify another site. So one of the things is it really kind of covers is briefing of staff. That's so important. And not only the briefing, but we really identify those areas that are really, you know, the, the things that you really do need to cover uh, with staff. So for example, you know, covering registration. Uh, let me pull that up, so let me read this. So some of the areas for briefings, registration, dormitory management, feeding, disaster health services, um, and, and you're going to want to make sure that you cover assignments uh, for all of these areas. And so this is a pretty comprehensive list of those areas in the shelter or the care and shelter site that you're going to need to assign out to staff. If you don't have enough people to assign to all of those, um, and again, you're going to be working very closely with American Red Cross. So if they're in there with you coordinating the shelter, the site, then they're going to be overseeing this assignment of staff positions. Uh, but if it's a city managed shelter, uh, care and shelter site, and you don't have Air American Red Cross there, you're going to have to prioritize. I mean, common sense will tell you that you definitely have to have somebody over feeding. You definitely have to have somebody over registration. If it's an overnight, you're going to have necessarily, you really have to have somebody for dormitory management. So you may have to prioritize those assignments. But that's a pretty good list. Everything else is pretty straightforward um, and it goes into ongoing action. So you had preparing the site ahead of time. The clients come in, you've got ongoing actions under this checklist. Again, you'll see that city position uh, that you have to, if there's an issue you have to communicate to, if there's no incident command post, no EOC activation. Um, one of the things that's really important is American Red Cross does a daily shelter report usually at midnight, at midnight. But your jurisdiction may want a more, uh, uh, a few more situation reports coming into the EOC. So one of the things that you have to have, be sure that you're implementing is that periodic situation update to your EOC or the command post or to a, whatever city position requires it as on a need to know basis. So you have to have that in, but you are gonna have to also include American Red Cross even if they aren't at your shelter site, um, you have to update them on your shelter uh, stats and your shelter information. So that one bullet talks about that in the update. The good news is, is the American Red Cross shelter log is a real good form to use for that. Obviously, American Red Cross is going to accept that as a situation report, but you can also use it internally. But if you do have another situation report form from the EOC, and I'm, this is kind of a repeat of what I mentioned earlier in the workshop, is you're going to want to make sure that you capture the right information that the EOC or the command post is looking for. So you just go over that form. This is what I'm going to report. Is there anything else that you need? So you just do that quick discussion beforehand. So I'm not going to go over bullet action. There's closing actions. OK. so. So that's pretty, that's a three page shelter manager checklist and actually it was taken best practices. A lot of the, a lot of the checklist items were taken directly from American Red Cross, but they were also taken from some other states that do sheltering all the time. I actually pulled from Miami Dade. Obviously you can imagine they do care and shelter a lot there. Um, and then there was, I think, Seattle, uh, which has an incredibly great emergency management program. So I actually did research on some best practices from others. Feel free to add any of the other checklist items or delete, but I, that, I feel this checklist will do, do a pretty good service. Um, the next checklist that we did for you is a communications checklist. And this kind of mirrors back what I told you about 
is the first thing is you're going to have you're going to there's going to be communication systems that you're going to have to make sure you have in place and that's things like does your shelter have phones um, does your shelter have access to computers so you can actually log into the software programs that your EOC or your command post are using so you can just go ahead and do updates through there are you going to use hard copy forms okay are you going to have to fax over are you going to have to email electronic documents over and then the worst case scenario and I will tell you that your plans do need to address it in the event that we have you know region wide or county wide or even your jurisdiction wide outages are you able to do a runner system of passing information back and forth you guys are really lucky in your jurisdictions. We're 473 geographical miles in LA, so you can imagine trying to set up a runner system, but we all know that that is something that we do face in a catastrophic level. You know, can we plan for everything? No, but it's probably highly likely. So is there an ability to do that between police stations and fire stations once they finish their windshield surveys, possibly, or even disaster service workers? So could we set up a runner, you know, program if we can pass on the roads, things like that. There's restrictions, but you have to think about that worst case scenario. Do you have satellite phones? You know, are you tapped into the state's OASIS system, the operational area satellite information system, things like that. But when we talk about the other side of communication, which is informational needs, you really actually have two areas of informational needs. Your clients need informational needs. So those people coming into the shelter are going to want information. They're going to want to know, first of all, what's happening with the disaster, what's government doing about it, um, and how, you know, what can I, what could I possibly expect? How soon could I expect to get back to my home? And you're going to do the best you can to provide that information. If you noticed in the shelter structure, that, that ICS structure, the five functions, did you notice there was a public information officer attached to the management up at the top of the organization? So even if you don't have a formal public information officer in your, uh, that's able to assist at a shelter because you're stretched so thin, you need to assign public information responsibilities to somebody in the shelter. Okay, and that's the responsibility of the shelter manager. And the reason is, is you could have media showing up and the media have to be managed. We all know that. Um, media does not have open access into a shelter whenever they want, but we do have to allow media to come in, and so that has to be managed. Not only that, just like the statements that we make that come out of a command post or out of an EOC, as a jurisdiction, you need to be talking with one voice. So whoever has that public information officer responsibility at the shelter should be coordinating with the field PIO if there's one activated, the EOC PIO, or even the city manager or the city mayor's office, their public relations person, to make sure that whatever public information is released to the media has been approved. And the shelter manager definitely, if they're the one speaking, whatever message they're going to provide to the, to the media has to be approved by field command in the EOC and the city manager's office. I'm imagining in your jurisdiction. It was like that with us too. So a shelter manager just doesn't have the freedom to, you know, say they're, they're in that public information uh, network of there's a formal process to that. So, but you do need that function in there. But there's also the informational needs of your shelter team. And that comes with briefings, transition briefings. You know, what can they expect during shifts? What are their assignments? Things like that. So this, this uh, communications checklist really kind of divides those out so you can actually make sure that you have those in place. Like your staff is going to need to have general disaster updates also, just like your clients are, so they can kind of know what to expect. Um, staff meetings, um, good idea to periodically go ahead and schedule staff meetings so you can get out, you know, general information, things like maybe there's some changes in certain policies or, you know, maybe there's going to be a change in operational shifts, but you definitely want to at least schedule one to two staff meetings throughout an operational period because even if you have nothing to share, allowing staff to come in collectively together and just provide input, you, have, you may have staff that have identified issues or seen issues that you don't know anything about. So it's a good, uh, it's a good resource to go ahead and provide that two-way communication. 
Uh, shift change briefly, briefings, definitely, if you have an operational period transitioning out, you want to do that shift, shift transition briefing just like we do in field command or the EOC. Or if I'm leaving, let's say I'm a shelter unit position, um, I'm the feeding unit in the shelter and I'm leaving, I definitely want to provide that shift change briefing to the incoming feeding unit manager. So um, that's something to look at is those shift changes, the briefings then for that. Um, our, the American Red Cross shelter log sheets, we talked about those. Those are a really good resource to use as an official situation report. Definitely they can be used to send over to American Red Cross. They can also be used to, to send to your EOC or your command post. But you, what you want to make sure is that it captures the, all the information that they're expecting to get from you. So that's something you'll have to vet ahead of time, whether that form captures everything that you need. Okay, so moving down, and we're on page 62. So shelter client involvement. And this is at your discretion, but you will have organizations and people in your community that have a very strong established network already. They actually are very connected to the community and can actually be a great resource for you. And where they can be a resource is, is let's say you wanted to do some client briefings. A lot of times having the leaders, the already pre-established community leaders doing these briefings, I think that Michael talked to you about the distrust of government. Unfortunately, we all know it exists. So, uh, leveraging those uh, communities that have that trust, especially your faith-based organizations who are already embedded, they're like the cornerstone of the community, leveraging them and working with them as part of your shelter team if they want to volunteer. And you will have people that will walk up to you and say, hey, how can I help? Utilizing them for this conduit between you and the clients in there is really effective. So when you're as a shelter manager, look for those opportunities to bring those, those clients in that can be your leaders and then leverage their strong connections in the, in the community to really be an effective tool for you, okay? But again, that's at your discretion and you're gonna have to make that judgment call because in the heat of the battle when you're first opening up, you may not be able to, because you're gonna need to communicate with them, you're almost gonna have to kind of make them part of the team. So you have to think about how, can, how quickly can you do that? So here's just some informational needs for the American Red Cross or other city locations. And you notice we identify the command post, the EOC, and your executives. You may have certain executives that want to be, especially in the political arena, because this is dealing with human needs, you may have some executive level that have information needs also. And so meeting ahead of time and asking them, hey, what information needs do you have to make sure you're capturing that on your logs? The next attachment is really a list of care and shelter resources. If you notice, it goes through those personnel positions that are recommended in a shelter. Uh, then we go into equipment and supplies, general supplies, mass care kits, nursing kits, shelter manager kits, animal and service animal supplies. If there's something that you don't have and it's on this list, feel free to delete it. But if you notice, a lot of these are pretty uh, are, are some core supplies that it's a good idea to have. Those shelter kits are really a great recommended best practices just to have those crates that you can pick up, have all your forms already filed. It's got all your basic supplies and kits. So taking a look at that shelter kit and reviewing the supplies that are recommended for that is really a good idea. Um, but some of the uh, supplies like the medical and nursing supplies, you may not be able to provide those at shelters. The good news is American Red Cross, and then if you know, public health is supporting or any kind of emergency services are there, they're gonna have some of those basic medical supplies. But most of these are pretty core. Most of these you can go to your local pharmacy and pick up, so they're not terribly um, difficult. Attachment F is just really kind of a description of types of care and shelter sites. Uh, a temporary evacuation point, that's, pla that's a place where first responders may move people immediately out of the path of danger or threat, and they may could just take them to a temporary evacuation point. Actually, you may actually start to do some intake there. There's a lot of jurisdictions across the United States that are actually starting to do their shelter intake at these evacuation points, and they've got barcoded bracelets 
that go on as the people get on transportation or their move from that point to a more established shelter, care and shelter site, they are actually given bracelets. So they start that intake at the point where they're first coming into the system. And then as they move into the shelter, that barcode moves through the, all the registration forms and everything to collect those, um, that information. I will tell you though, that you have to be really careful with barcodes because the human mind does not like to think that they're just a set of numbers, especially when they've been impacted with disaster. So if you implement a program like that, it's very effective and actually um, it, it's, it's logistically, it's a great way because if you have an electronic scanning system, if, if you embed that information at the point of entry with that barcode, um, every time you scan that barcode, it updates with that same original information so you're not duplicating effort. But that's a very complicated system, but that's why a lot of jurisdictions like uh, back east with the hurricane evacuations and things like that, they've moved to that because they're doing it all the time. So it's streamlined their intake process. Very wary of putting on a bracelet, having a barcode, having you scan. Um, we have seen some abuse where um, some agencies have tried to get access to vulnerable populations, just saw it up in Ridgecrest. So we're kind of right now backing away from barcoding people. There you go. Um, just, and so you kind of have to go with the flow. You kind of have to figure out what's going to work best in whatever your situation is. But the thing to remember is that in any, any shelter where you would have a Red Cross sign up or in that kind of partnership, because some are totally independent, they do what they want, a lot of churches do that. Some are all Red Cross and follow the protocol, but most of them are partners. We're gonna be working together. So sometimes you have those discussions about how to best meet the needs of the people, and that's the priority here, exactly. not the tracking of us. And that's what's complex about when we're in the area, the arena of human care and needs is there's so many, we're, we're, de we're dealing with a diversity of needs and wants and expectations and so it's challenging. So, I mean, and that's why you have to choose it. But I, like I said, I do know um, back east, they've there's utilized it to. Where you have large, large yeah, yeah, they, they almost are, you know, they almost have to, to be able to handle the mass amount of people that they're moving from point A to point B. We talk a little bit about spontaneous shelters and we're just gonna reemphasize these are those shelters that crop up, um, you know, like parks, uh, and maybe a, a, you, you, know, you have to put up a tent. And we definitely wanna emphasize that that's your last resort. You really, do, that is it, it, with the extent of dedicated resources and the amount of time to support that kind of a location, um, it's really difficult. Is it going to happen in an emergency? It, it's a possibility. So we identify it as a possibility, but it should be your last resort. You always wanna move people to some type of a facility if at all possible, because your labor, the labor support and your resource support for something that isn't a facility is going to be almost 100% more just because you've gotta embed a lot more staffing, perimeter control, things like that. Uh, and, and so you got to think about that. And then not only that, the problem with a lot of these spontaneous shelter sites is um, it's very hard and difficult to keep the sanitation uh, at a, the level that it's, you know, for a, a care and shelter site. And you could have public health and public health will show up to do inspections. You could have public health come in and say, I'm sorry, you can't, you can't do this. And so you risk that because of the whole public health issue and the difficulty of keeping people in open areas you know, for an extended period of time because you don't have the facilities to do it. You definitely don't have the bathrooms, you don't have the, the sanitation support, and you're already in the middle of an emergency, highly unlikely that you're gonna have the, the staff to maintain that kind of a site for any kind of extended period. So last resort, always. Okay, and again, another one is environmental health services could also come in and shut you down too. We identify those. And that goes with this outdoor care and shelter sites. They're kind of hand in hand. Uh, household pet shelters. So again, this plan is not your pet shelter plan. Um, what I would recommend is you take that document that I provide in the back of the manual. And if you're a small jurisdiction, you can go ahead and do an attachment. Maybe you wanna do a pet sheltering attachment that kind of describes um, how you will provide pet sheltering. Remember, 
service animals um, go into your shelter. You, they go with their owners. But you are going to have to provide some support. You notice that was the basic animal supplies I had at the bottom of the supply checklist for animals, some food, water, water bowls, leashes. Um, you definitely want to have that because you never know. Uh, but your, your pet sheltering can be a separate plan or it can just be an attachment. Or it can be an attachment if you're going to, if I think somebody said all we have is an EOP, so our mass care and shelter annex is going to be part of the EOP, then this is how you would do it. You would have your EOP and then you might have a mass care attachment or an, uh, well, no, I guess you could have an appendix attached to the e EOP. So it's still one document, it's not a separate document. And then you just insert an attachment for pet sheltering under your mass care and shelter annex in the EOP. Your EOP is gonna be huge though. <laughs> that's the only problem with incorporating one plan. And so, you know, but that's an option to do. But definitely you're gonna have to build out that pet sheltering component because it is required under the uh, uh, the post-Katrina Pet Act. Okay, the last attachment, that's really easy. That's just a list of your shelter sites and that's, you're gonna fill that out. We didn't fill that out for you. Uh, remember that shelter site is also a list that you wanna have in your EOC. Uh, you wanna have it available to the command post somehow that they can access and at least see, you know, what you consider, it, what's been inspected what has accessibility compliance, things like that. So those are the good, uh, that's a good list to have, but the, first, the, pl the one place you definitely need to have it is in this annex at the end. And I'll tell you what, that is the end of the template. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open it up for any questions, we'll take a break, and then we'll close it out with the next steps after the workshop.